Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about understanding volts and amps. So I'm going to ask you this question here. Uh, this right here. See right here? These pull four amps each, and this only pulled one amp, right? Okay, so how many volts am I going to have here? How many volts do I got here? Well, 14 and a half is what I'm showing at the battery, right? Yeah. Well, how many amps do I got here? We're measuring an amp this way with an inductive lead. So how many amps I got? If this one pulls four each and that pulled one, how many amps? Huh? Yeah. No, four. Four, 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 one. Four plus four? Eight, nine. Nine amps. Okay, so you got 14 and a half volts, you got nine amps, right? Okay, so how many volts have I got here? We've already gone through two fuses. So how many volts and amps have I got here? Just say what comes to mind, man. So if you've got 14 and a half here and nine there, what are you going to have here? 14 and a half and nine. That ain't complicated. Y'all thought it was a trick question. That's what it was. Yeah. Alright, so how many amps I got right here? Now, to tell you the truth, we're probably going to be losing a little bit of each connection. But we're not going to figure that in. We ain't talking about voltage drop. What about volts and amps here? 14 and a half. What about here? 14 and a half. Uh, 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 uh. Nope. Think about what you're saying. 14 and a half and 4. I mean, 8. Is, is well, it 8, no. right? I mean, how many? This, this whole assembly pulls four amps. Is what I mean, I just said that. So oh. you're right. This is 14 and a half volts and four amps because you're only measuring through one. Okay, I see. All right, so how many volts and amps have you got here? You got 14.5 and... No, you know, this is ground. You ain't got no volts oh. here. Oh. Trick question. <laughs> but you have amps. One amp. One amp. If you were measuring it, uh, across all of these, you'd have nine amps. So you're going to have the same number of amps all the way through the circuit, but you're only going to have volts on the positive because you're measuring from the negative, okay? You got that? When I went to Craig Van Battenberg's uh, hybrid class, he gave us a test, several little tests like this, and there were 16 people in that class, and me and two other guys got all over right. But uh, you got to understand that, you know. But uh, anyway, a lot of times when you're taking a test, what you need to do is you just need to recognize the fact that you just need to calm down, just relax, and don't overthink it. You know what I mean? Some people crash on ASC tests because they're overthinking it. And, they're, and, and ASC questions are all about generic cars. They're not going to ask you a, a specific question about a Toyota or a Ford or a Dodge. It's something that will be true on every car, pretty much. All right, voltage drop measurement. All right, right here I got 11.8. All right, you see this one here? This this meter is hooked up between there and there. All right, we lost the voltage right here, see? Little tiny bit, right? This is how much it delivers the load. All right, now, see how we, we got 1.32 volts there that we dropped because of this resistor. You see the resistor? Now, you have a little tiny bit because you got connections here. But where you've got a resistor, you got 11, 0.84, you got 10.53. If you add this to that, you'll get that. The sum of these voltage drops always winds up being the same as that. You're going to drop all the voltage all the way across the circuit. If you just have a, the motor, is you're going to be dropping all the, so it's, you're dropping actually 10.53 off, but you're already dropping some here before you get there. See, so I've got that meter hooked up. All right, so every part of a circuit, even a wire, has some resistance and will drop some voltage. A piece of wire 60 feet long has an ohm of resistance just because it's 60 feet long. And when the switch is on, the current is flowing resistance causes some of the voltage and current not to make it to the load. And sometimes resistance is built into a circuit, like on this fan. See that? And when we turn it on low, it's going through all of these and that little thermal fuse before it ever makes it a blower motor. So the blower motor doesn't spin very fast, but there's a lot of heat being generated right here. That's why they put that blower resistor in the airstream so that the air that's blowing across there is going to keep it cool. There's one lady I stopped beside the road to help out a bunch of guys looking around under her hood. And I said, what happened here? She said, a bunch of smoke came out of the dash. I looked and she had an old low blow. 
I said, and I smelled it, it smelled like leaves. I said, you're running on low blow? He said, yeah. I said, the problem done under the hood, it's in the dash, you got leaves laying on your blower resistor and they got hot and set fire to the leaves. So what you need to do is turn off your blower and just drive it somewhere and get somebody to pull that air back in the leaves. Oh, okay. All right, so this limits blower speed so that it operates a low, medium, and high. See all that, man? We got to drop some voltage here. All right, and so basically, you know, you can do some math here. If you multiply that times that, you'll get this. If you divide that into that, you'll get that. If you divide that into that, you'll get that. That's the EIR thing, you know, the triangle. All right. And so basically, if blower motor's energized and blowing, then so you don't, you know, you can actually do your holding drop measurements on each one of those and across the whole thing. And draw much of off. Then there's the places you don't want it. Spin the starter with a meter set up like you're showing. You're going from that big terminal, the starter, to the positive battery post. You're allowed to have a half a volt of drop from the negative battery post to the starter body, because that's where you're measuring. You know, as you, you go to the body ground, you also go to the block ground, which I didn't draw that. But the long and the short of it is, you're not allowed to have but a tenth of a volt there. And if you've got a bad connection in here that you can't see, or a dirty terminal right here, I've actually taken a test light and when I had it hooked to this, and touched it there, got a bright light, and touched it there, got a real dim light. Move, move the cable to get back. You were dropping your voltage right here. All right. Bad connections are possible anywhere there's a connection, including the innards of the switch. If it starts to get a little hot, it starts to get oxidized, it starts to build resistance, it starts to make heat, and it's just kind of melts it right out of there. And it gets to where no current's flowing at all. And I said, my blower motor's not working, you unplug it. It may be that the blower resistor can melt like this. I got two or three of them that we've changed recently. Uh, the blower relay or anything like that, if you see anything, uh, you got issues, right? Current flowing through resistance makes heat, heat oxidizes the connection, makes more heat, more resistance, and finally it just melts down. Now this is your blower resistor. Your thermal limiter right there, you get your resistor poles, and there's your blower resistor. That's what it looks like basically. Now, nowadays they got a lot of electronic ones and they look different from this and all that. So when resistance is designed into a circuit, they're mounted in the blower's airstream to keep them cool. And so you know that's just something I wanted to say there. Now, when you're troubleshooting an operative component, understand the circuit. You notice, look at this, there's two wires, both going to the same place. You notice that? Two wires. Fuel pump relay, they got two wires feeding it. The reason they're doing that is because they want to make sure there's plenty of power to carry, I mean, plenty of wire to carry that current because they don't want it to heat up and burn out like I showed you on that other connector there. And so over time, you know, they're concerned about since the circuit's parallel, the overall natural resistance of the wire and the connectors is cut in half. If you've got two resistors, remember what I told you, if you got a 10 ohm and a 10 ohm, 10 ohm parallel, that's like 5 ohms. If you got a 10 ohm and a 10 ohm in series, that's 20 ohms. But if they're in parallel, it cuts it in half. You got it? You understand parallel what I'm saying? Huh? Parallel cuts it in half. Well, yeah, parallel cuts it in half. And remember, and I got that up on the wall out there, the little reminder things that I got posted. But basically, imagine holes in a bucket. Let's say a 10 ohm hole, you know, was letting a certain amount of water out. Mm -hmm. If you put another 10 ohm hole, you know, the holes get bigger as the ohms go down, less resistance. If I put two 10 ohm holes, that's as much as a 5 ohm hole. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Yeah. You, does that make sense now? Yeah. I mean, it's real simple sense. when you think of it that way. All right. So, now then, realize the ground connection on the other side of a component should show at the harness pin that feeds power to the component. I've already told you about this. I pull a relay and I find a pin that's going out in the fuel pump or the fan or whatever. I ought to hook the power and I ought to be able to touch that and that'll come on. Because coming through that motor all the way up to that relay pin, I ought to see a ground. I do that all the time when I'm checking for fuel pumps. If I saw somebody come in I thought I had a bad fuel pump, hook it to the hot, go to the fuel pump relay, touch it to, to the pin going out to the pump. And you get, you get do enough of these, you get to where you recognize that fairly easy. Pin going out, make sure you're on the right one though. That pin's going out to the pump, and you don't see any power there, kick the gas tank, if it comes on, you got a bad fuel pump. <laughs> real quick, I mean, you can know real fast. And on those Chevys, it's pretty easy, a lot of them, because they'll have a fuel pump relay, and they'll have a little uh, uh, pin there that says prime. Like what you're talking, I think he's got that. See what I'm saying? All right, so anyway. Oh, this is the same vehicle, two years newer. Never assume you know the circuit. Always look it up. See this? This right here is going through a fuel pump driver module. On that particular one, 
you're not going to read a ground like I was talking about because it's got a fuel pump driver module in between. So make sure you know how it's wired up before you just assume anything. You know, if it's much newer to 2000 model, uh, you're, if it is a Ford, you're probably going to have a fuel pump driver module. Alright. Now, half the current goes through the fuel pump relay to the fuel pump and it encounters that on the way. Now the electronic throttle control was dead on this 2004 Chevy Silverado. We got a no calm fault between the electronic throttle control module and the PCM. Uh, General Motors went electronic throttle control before Ford did because they just put a standalone module over there that's only job was to do electronic throttle control and the engine controller would communicate with it. And Ford stayed away from electronic throttle control until they came out with this black oak processor that would talk faster. You know, because it's got to be instantaneous, it's got to be really fast to be able to operate. The instrument cluster message said it was reported reduced engine power. All right, so this little module is not a whole lot to it. You've got two connectors here. Uh, and these are the two pinouts right here. And ground, ground, power. All right, so the only power feed to the box comes from the uh, ETC CM fuse. We checked that first and we found it blown. That fuse was popped. No wonder why communicating the stupid thing to sleep. Now he woke up. Alright. We replaced the fuse and turned on the ignition. The fuse blew again like a flashbulb. You know how good I had to be with my camera to catch that when it blew? Got it. Yep. Actually, I took a video and I took a video and frame forward it and found it blowing and captured it. But that was the actual fuse blowing in that thing when it happened. All right, so since there's only one ground on the whole box, so we checked every cavity, and 15 was the only one with solid ground, and since the fuse didn't blow with the box disconnected, the ETC module had to be the problem. Now, one of these wires goes to the chimsel. You know what the chimsel is, right? C-H-M-S-L. What does that stand for? Every vehicle's got one. And they have, the cars have had them since 86. Center high mount stoplight. Uh, so you might, you know, we were checking for a ground. We found one ground that was going to center high mount stoplight, but when you match a break, it went away. Okay. All right. So anyway, there's only one ground on the whole box. We checked every cavity. Fifteen no one saw the ground. It, ETC module had to be the problem. Blowing its own fuse. It's got ground. It's got power. Only one power going to it. If you ask a person in charge for permission to take something that belongs to the company and the person in charge says you can take it, both of you are guilty, but who bears the most guilt? The person in charge actually gave you a property he didn't own, making a person who gave it more responsible. Like when somebody from another program comes over, he says, I need a fuse. I was like, why does the college owe you a fuse, man? <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't even use these fuses on my car. You know, I go buy me a little box of fuses from Harbor Freight or wherever, and I carry them with me. For the All right, another 2004 Silverado. The blower motor on this one wouldn't work on high speed. <laughs> now, usually, what I always like to say, well, look here, that's probably going to be this fuse right here, because that fuse is going to be what it uses just for high speed. You notice whenever you come up, it's going through the resistors until you get to high, and then it energizes that blower motor relay, and when it does, that pulls over, and it's getting power directly from there to the blower motor, and that's going to make it blow at high speed. Now, on the older trucks like his, there's a little small fuse in the fuse panel that does that job. A little tiny mini fuse. This one here uses one of the big maxi fuses, which is that one right there. The blower fuse on this truck is one of the big heavy fuses on the older models with the mini fuse that was up in this area here. All right, so. Could it be the fuse? Well, the blower fuse is dedicated to just the blower, so maybe, but the fuse wasn't blown. And that relay is built into the blower resistor assembly. Okay? All right, the blower would work on high sometimes. We caught it not working, and we tapped on that built-in relay, whack, boom, started blowing high. Be careful about that. Hey, you know why? I had his Lincoln Town car one time that came to me, and I worried it in Ford place. 1995, a long time ago, I mean, ages ago, before most of y'all were born. Yeah. But anyway, I turned the blower, I mean, they said, when you hit a bump, the blower comes on high. No matter what you got it set on, when you hit a bump, it comes on high. I said, well, that's interesting. So I got a, my long extension out of my toolbox, and I use it like a cue stick playing pool, mm -hmm. and with the blower blowing on low, I just tap that relay, and it goes boom, and blowing on high, that's all. That's all got to be that blower, sister. 
And you know, it's a blower controller, it had a resistor built in like that. So I sent off up to the Lincoln dealership because we didn't have to have one. Got that back down here, hundred dollar. Put it on there. And like these country boy says around here, just like it was, just like it was. <laughs> didn't change a dead gum thing. I could still bump that brand new and come on. What happened was the control head was leaking eight volts out into the relay coil. Was enough to hold it in if it jumped in, but it wasn't enough to pull it in. You hit it, it bounced in and stayed until you switch your car off and it drop off and you have a little blow again to get another bump. So what I did was I got a little potentiometer and I hooked into that and there in the control head and I dialed up enough resistance to where that eight volts was shorted away, but when it wanted to energize it really, it still could. And then I got a resistor with that much resistance and soldered it in there <laughs> and fixed that sucker. So I would say there's nothing unsafe about it. Yeah. You, know, now you don't modify airbags, you don't modify cruise control, none of that kind of crap. But you know, if you want to do an AC control head and you know, try to fix a little something, sometimes you make a bigger mess. But I don't want to go back and tell a guy, hey, now you need a $400 control head because it looks terrible after you just spent $100 on a blower resistor, now you need a more expensive part. Right. What's even worse is when you put the expensive part on first and then you find out it's a cheap part. Okay. <laughs> that right. is. All right, so the relay was banned by the entire blower resistor that had to be replaced on this one. Well, sometimes the parts house ain't got, it, ain't got something that'll work. What we had was the one that come off with it was this one, the one they sent was that one. And the only way this thing would mount was with this cover over it. And that cover wouldn't work on this. And them holes wouldn't line up. The one they had at the park store just wouldn't fit. We had to get one from the Chevrolet place. Anyway, that's what we wound up holding in our hands here. All right, and then there's those times when the only way to make sure the module is a problem is either substitute a known good module, which may be fried by the vehicle just like the first one was. A lot of times your book will say that, substitute a known good part. Here's the thing. This guy that's working over at the local GM dealer, guy trained one over there, and uh, he's doing pretty well over there too, by the way. He's making good money and the guy likes him. Uh, he come over here and said, I'm working on this Chevrolet pickup about the same year model as yours. And he says, the daytime running lights don't work. Okay. Uh, what have you done? He said, "Well, I've, you know, check some TSBs and you know, pull, put a scan tool on it and, and uh, call the hotline, replace the uh, electric guide. A little, you know, uh, on the dash is a little electric guide that whenever it sees dark, it comes on, you know, and you got it drive." He says, "Put one in there, still doesn't do anything." And I said, "What'd you do then?" He said, "Well, I put another one in there, still doesn't do nothing." I said, "Okay, that's what you're gonna do. Get your potentiometer. You know what that voltage is supposed to be." When that you know, thing is supposed to pull that voltage to a certain level, hook that potentiometer up in place of that resistor, I mean that little light sensor, and dial in the right amount of ohms and see what happens. So he did that and he called me and said, The lights came on. I said, You got a bad uh, electric guy, you know, light sensor. Well, I've already put two on there, so I don't care. He put one, put another one, put another one. He said, It still ain't fixed. I said, okay, I got that 2001 Chevy pickup sitting out there It's a trainer truck. Borrow the one off of it. Take it over here to Chevrolet place and put it on there. So he put that on there and he said, hey, it worked with the one that came off your truck. I said, you got four bad parts. Every darn one in the pipeline for a while was a bad one. And I said, the thing about it is, when everything else has been eliminated, what's left has got to be what's wrong. And that's what it was. He actually had put the right amount of bullion there. The body controller was doing what it was supposed to do. It was acting on what it saw. And those little uh, light sensors are lying through their teeth. All right. Now, you can remove the suspect module and install it on a good vehicle. Imagine that. I think this module's bad. So I put it on a vehicle there's nothing wrong with it. If the vehicle or nothing wrong with it runs like crap, now I know the module's bad. But what if I took the good module off the of vehicle that runs just fine and put it on the uh, one that's running crappy, and then I put it back on the good truck, and now the good truck's running crappy? I burned up the module. You're not going to, typically you're not going to hurt a truck with a bad module, but you can hurt a good module with a bad truck. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Just keep that in So that's what I put on this next slide. Even if the bad mo even the module is proven to be bad, there's a question of what caused the module to fail. Is it an intermittent short and another bad module connected to the one that burned out? You've got to be careful not to waste anybody's money. Now, Let's do one that's a little more complicated. Now this one here, you may lose track of this one before we get through. This is one that I worked on back in 2003. I always remember all of these, you know. <laughs> all right. Uh, 2000 F1 Super Duty, 19,000 miles, 73 power truck, automatic transmission, four-wheel anti-lock brake on, ABS module won't talk. 
a PCM sees no vehicle speed. I actually did this one when I was helping them out at the Ford place over uh, where I used to work. I mean, that was after I came to work here, but I went over it on a Friday afternoon. All right, look at the big picture. Power circuit 533, feet of pin 14, the center of the schematic. See that? That's a circuit number. That's the color of the wire. Splice, circuit number, connector number, connector number. See this dotted line that's connected to them connectors? That means they're going through the same connector shell up there. That's going through the same connector shell down there. All right, so it says splice 22, S235 and connector 10, C1050 are possible trouble spots on this circuit. And it also feeds the turn signal flasher, and the turn signal didn't work either. Seems to me like the guy would have noticed that the turn signal didn't work, right? Yeah. You didn't say nothing about it. All right, this is an overview of the route the power takes all the way to the module. All right, so there's your junction box. That's what that connector looks like. Okay, it goes through that one. It goes through that pin right there. Uh, your, your, uh, uh, doing an open tool like that, isn't it? I know, but they don't have an 1116s. Oh, 1116s? Well, I'll try 1700. Okay. Alright, so, so there, it goes through here. Now, these connectors here plug into one another. And then after it leaves there, it goes down here to the ABS one. So what we need to see, I need to see if I got power right here. Because if the ABS module is not powered up, or if it's not grounded, it ain't talking, then your ABS light's going to be on. And if it's what filters the speed signal and sends it to other things, all that other crap that uses that speed signal ain't going to work either. But in this particular case, it's not like that. All right, so I remove the two bolts holding the front left hand fender flash shield, and I access this connector. Found out pin 14 in the real world is pretty easy with a shop manual pinout chart. There's your little pinout. Pin 14, power, hot and run. Right there, right here. See that? That's not used. The black ones aren't used. Go in here. I got some power right here. Right? I actually went in there to check to see if I had power there. Now I will tell you this, when you're checking something uh, that may be intermittent, it's a whole lot, it's a really good idea to hook you up something so you'll know if you get power there when you're fooling with the wires. So if I hook into that pin and I hook my test light in there, I'm going to know if I've jiggled some wires up the line and that thing suddenly wakes up. If you don't know when something suddenly wakes up, you won't know where you were when you fixed it, and now you won't know how long it's going to stay fixed before it comes back again. Right? But if you got that light in there and you're moving that harness and you get a certain like, oh, 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 there it is right there. Look, 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 where, that's, look where that's broken. Look where that's broken. Look where that rat's been. <laughs> this one guy was out there walking out, walking out. He's out working out there and he's working at his Bronco too. And when he opened the hood, there's a big old rat sitting on top of the engine. Ah! The rat runs <laughs> off, you know, and he's looking around. I don't see where that rat went. He didn't see him go nowhere. And now, so, he go reach down there feeling that oxygen sister ground on the back of that head. He's, Head is down there. This one guy comes sneaking up there by. So he, he had his hand down there and he reached in there and he goes, with his fingernails on his head. He, goes, <laughs> <laughs> he just knew that rat eating him alive. The other guy didn't even know he saw a rat. He scared him. I thought would have freaked out too. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't even gonna lie. <laughs> well, every now and then we see the big old rats about this tall, you know. Yeah. yeah. This connector C1050 looks like that right there. But you know the three connectors that wind up and going through the bulkhead like on the ring. All right, circuit 533 travels through pin 30 and C1050, one of the three large bulkhead connectors. Applying power to the male side of the connector fired up the test light, which was connected to the ABS box. See what I'm doing is I'm putting power in here and see if I get it there, put power in here and see if I get it there. And that way I'm isolating the parts of the circuit and all that. Mm -hmm. And uh, these connector numbers, when you start spouting them off, just confuse the crap out of you. So the shop foreman came in there one day and said, you find out what's wrong with that motor home? I says, yeah, you know where the 90, 930, the 12, 51, 581 wire harness go together? Yeah, yeah, that's smart, man. I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> anyway, it wasn't put, it wasn't put together good, you know. But I had to write all that down on a work order because it was a warranty repair. And they want to know exactly which connector, exactly where it was, exactly what the problem was. They don't want you to say fix wires. They charge that one back. <laughs> all right, the circuit from the bulkhead of the module proved me just fine. It would carry test light current. So I actually went, what I did was, see what I'm backing up here. See right here? Now what I was basically doing was I was checking from here to here. Right? And then I was going to check from here to here. So I mean I still have my little wire hooked in here with a light connected to it. And so what I next thing I was going to do is go right here and connect some power to here and see if that light would come on. That way it would tell me it's good all the way in. That make sense? Yeah. Alright. So I mean you, you gotta think about it. 
They said, come over and say, oh, no, you know, this kind of stuff. You've got to be able to figure it out. So this is where critical thinking kicks in. Rather than simply memorizing facts, you've got to be able to think, right? Okay, AC clutch feed. Basically, when I went looking in the book, the pin out was all screwed up. And, uh, that was one of those things where I basically had to go in there and look at some other information to find out which pin was the right one, but it'll mess you up. Anyway, the citizen here is talking about, you know, other stuff. But one way or another, we wound up getting it. Whenever I put power in underneath, I don't know why I didn't put that picture up there. I thought I had, but I guess I left it off. When I went to that connector that was coming out of the uh, junction box, which the junction box is uh, the one I've had over here before. You know them kind of look like that right there? Mm -hmm. Those great junction boxes. Uh, those things up, that's actually the fuse box, and it's got these big connectors going in the back. And I came off of that, you know, pull that uh, out, found the right pin, I put power in it, and that one came on. That told me the junction box was bad. Is what happened. So the junction box sometimes would have to be replaced. It's laminated. You know, that thing looks like something you could take apart and play with and look at all kind of cool stuff in it. It's got laminated plates in there with tab bent up and plugs with fuses them. I tried to take one of them apart and I said, man, this is a hopeless case. In a way, you're going to fix that darn thing. I don't know how they made it. But, uh, but sometimes the windshield would leak and, and you know, wet them things and it would start getting chalky down there and mess them up. I've seen headlights come on and wouldn't go off. I've seen speedometers that would go up to 25 mile an hour and drop to zero. I mean, it's all kinds of electrical problems. And uh, Joey's boy uh, had one that was giving trouble like that. And um, after we put that box on there, his alternator went bad and confused him into thinking he had a, another bad box. But anyway, it turned out that he had a bad alternator. He also had a bad power relay because he, it wouldn't start. And he had a theft light flashing. And when I went out there, it looked so he had barely any power at all going to the fuel injectors. And so when I tapped the power relay, it came on bright, and all he needed was a relay to fix it. Anyway, that's the end of that show. Did you learn something you didn't know? There's a lot. <laughs> yep. You're gonna get you're gonna get this stuff if I keep hammering you with it. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Sooner or later, you're gonna start start soaking up. And when you're looking at a relay circuit, uh, basically what you got is you're supposed to have if that relay is energized. If you got a relay that's energized and it's supposed to be working, you're supposed to have two powers and two grounds. One of the grounds is going to be coming back through your load. One of the grounds is going to be to the relay coil. Right? One of the powers is what's supposed to be fed out, and the other power is going to the other side of the relay coil. But you have to have the relay in a state, I mean that socket when you pull your relay out, you got to have it in a state where it's supposed to be operating that relay, but it's not. And so if you hook it and you say, i got two powers and two grounds, you'll know that you probably got a bad relay. Also, if you're testing a relay, just because a relay clicks doesn't mean it's good. Because it can click and still not be able to deliver power. I got smacked around like that a couple of times. Well, I mean, I say, well, it clicks, it must be good, you know. It turned out that the relay it, it wasn't good, and you're going to go all the way around Robin Hood's barn, and that's a long way sometimes, you know, finding your problem. So, anyway. Yep. Uh, incidentally, <laughs>